Hello, my name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders. I also work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials all across the UK. In June 2021, CrimeCon is coming to the UK. It will be full of experts such as myself and also law enforcement agents. They'll also be your favourite YouTubers and podcast makers. So I really hope to see you there. The series of crimes in a small farming community left people reeling in shock and fear. As the hunt for the suspects expanded, they turned to the FBI for help. They traveled over a thousand miles to find the deadly perpetrators before more innocent victims crossed their path. In June of 1997, a crime wave swept Iowa like a tornado. It left a trail of robbery, kidnapping, and murder in its wake. And then it moved on. No one knew where. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI committed its resources to tracking down the suspects. By the time they were identified, they already had a 12-hour lead. The pursuit would take the FBI across six states in their efforts to catch the killers. June 11, 1997, South Central Iowa. The farming region, rich with crops and livestock, began to stir as dawn became morning. Most farmhands had arrived hours earlier to begin their chores. But one who never missed a shift without calling had failed to show that day. Her boss, a nearby farmer, became worried when he called and got no answer. Since she lived alone, he went to check on her. He noticed her pickup truck wasn't there and the front door was ajar. Mom. Inside, he found the lifeless body of his farmhand, Barbara Garber. Barbara. Mahaska County Sheriff's Chief Deputy Paul DeGeest responded to the 911 alert. In 20 years of law enforcement, I've been involved with about uh, five or six homicides. So it's not something that happens a whole lot in Oskaloosa, Iowa, or Mahaska County. When we went into the living room, we observed Barb Garber's body. Uh, she was sitting upright, fully clothed in a chair. She was leaning over to the left side, and there was uh, uh, blood coming from her head. The sheriff called specialists from the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation to process the scene. The middle-aged woman had been shot four times at close range while she sat in the chair. Technicians recovered 22 caliber shell casings close to the victim. At her feet, they found her half-eaten breakfast. The absence of defensive wounds on the body indicated the farmhand had put up no struggle, according to Iowa Special Agent Michael Barrier. The house uh, did not appear to have any forced entry. Um, it looked like uh, someone had just entered the house, either been let in or had uh, gotten in without having to break in. Uh, the residence had a lived-in look but was not ransacked, and there was nothing obviously uh, taken from the residence, other than um, her, her 
her vehicle was missing from the driveway. Green pickup truck, the late farmer model. described the victim's vehicle as a late model dark green pickup truck. And that was her personal truck? Yes. Detectives issued a be on the lookout for the missing truck to all law enforcement in the area. Investigators spoke to her closest neighbor who lived a quarter mile down the road. She had noticed something earlier that day when she was on her way to work in the pre-dawn hours. All the way down there. She saw an unfamiliar blue hatchback or station wagon backing out of Mrs. Garber's driveway. But she didn't see who was inside, and she didn't get the license plate. This vehicle was described as a older, not in very good shape, station wagon type vehicle, uh, blue in color. Uh, the vehicle was not a vehicle that had been seen at the Garber residence before and was not really associated with the Garber residence, and so we felt that it may be and probably was a suspect vehicle. As police were talking to the neighbor, an alert came across the police radio. What you got? Okay, I'll be en route. A bank five miles away in the hamlet of Gibson had just been robbed. Deputies from two counties responded. Because deposits are insured by the federal government, the FBI was called in. Yes. The closest field office was 77 miles away in Cedar Rapids. Two males, armed. OK. All right, we'll be heading right there. Larry, we got a bank robbery in Gibson. OK. All right. FBI Special Agent Scott French was assigned the case. Anything else? Who are they armed with? All right, bye. The small savings bank in Gibson had just opened for business for the first time that day to the town's population of 70. Down south here. Right there. It has one paved road to the community of Gibson. The rest of the area is surrounded by farmland, with a few gravel roads uh, leading away from the community. It would take Agent French over an hour to get there. Sheriff's deputies arrived first to secure the crime scene and take witness statements. Bank employees told investigators that the robbery had occurred at about 10 a.m. They had no customers at the time, and there was no guard on duty. Only a teller and the manager were inside when the robbery took place. All right, get your hands up! Two armed robbers wearing dark ski masks, gloves, and brown coveralls burst into the bank. One held a shotgun while the other carried a handgun. The robbers scooped stacks of cash and banknotes into plastic trash bags. Come on, hurry up! Let's go! No, up against the wall! Go! Go! They had gotten away with $65,000 in cash. Though they wore masks, bank employees believe both men were white males. The Gibson Savings Bank did not have any security system. That is, no video cameras, no film to have recorded the robbery. This makes it difficult for investigators to have some evidence other than witness statements. Investigators found only one person who had seen anything, a 10-year-old girl. If you had to guess what kind of car would you see? She told agents that she'd been riding her bike across the street when the robbery occurred. Two men in ski masks holding bags had jumped out of a gray car and had run into the bank. She rode away before the men came out. The girl was either too young or too scared to get the license plate. Police put out an all-points bulletin alerting units to be on the lookout for a gray sedan as a possible getaway vehicle. I felt the robbers in this particular case 
were from the immediate area. First of all, the Gibson Bank is a very isolated location. Second of all, both individuals were wearing coveralls, which are somewhat indigenous to the working people in these communities. Car 32, car 32. Ten four. I got it. The deputy on his way to the robbery scene headed for likely routes the bandits would have used to escape. I'm going to check this out. We have a car match in the description. Two and a half miles from the bank, he noticed a gray sedan apparently abandoned in the middle of a farm field. No one was in sight. He checked the car and radioed in the license plate number. It was registered to a teenager by the name of Island Schultz, who lived nearby. He thought it was extremely unusual that this vehicle would be setting where it was. And knowing that they were only just a couple of miles away, uh, he drove to their house. Iowa communities are tight-knit, and the officer happened to know the Schultz family. At the teenager's home, he got no response. The deputy found the front door unlocked. Island? Inside, he discovered 18-year-old Island Schultz lying on the floor, shot to death. He radioed for assistance. Mahaska County Chief Deputy Paul DeGeest felt strongly that this second homicide was likely related to both the first murder and the bank heist. We're relatively sure in our own minds that these were all connected. They were in a five mile radius of each other. And uh, again, that's just not something you see a lot of in rural Iowa, where you would have uh, two bodies and a bank robbery all within a matter of uh, two hours. The recent high school graduate had been shot twice in the head from close range. An audio cassette and two 22 caliber shell casings, the same caliber found at the first murder scene, were recovered close to her body. Like the earlier homicide, investigators found no indication of forced entry and no defensive wounds on the young girl. Iowa Special Agent Michael Barrier discovered another important connection to the first murder victim, Barb Garber. A neighborhood canvas in the area of the Schultz residence uh, gave us information that a green pickup truck, newer, uh, in good shape, was seen parked in the Schultz driveway at about 9.30 a.m. that morning. Um, that's interesting to us because uh, Barb Garber's pickup is a newer, uh, dark green Dodge pickup truck. And so we believe that um, after her truck was stolen from her residence, that it ended up at the uh, Schultz residence. And that tied the two homicides together. Both bodies were sent to the county medical examiner for autopsy. Analysis of the bullets confirmed what investigators had suspected. Each victim had been killed with the same weapon a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. The FBI and local investigators assembled a command center in the Mahaska County Sheriff's Office. They set up a hotline and contacted the media with a description of the farmhand's late model dark green pickup truck. We occupied a large debriefing room which acted as a command post. We began to collate leads that were coming in from all parts of the community. There was also significant media attention at this point, which increased the volume of phone calls that were coming in. Deputies chased down dozens of leads. One was from a teenager who had seen a green truck that fit the description of the farmhand's pickup. He was in the town of Oskaloosa in the late morning when he noticed the truck drive past with two men inside. The witness didn't see their faces and he didn't get the license plate. 
It wasn't much to go on since that particular truck was so common in the area. We received dozens upon dozens of sightings, uh, most of which uh, turned out to be absolutely nothing. It was just a green 1997 pickup. And everybody that was driving one at some point in time that day in the Mahaska County area was stopped. Everyone except the driver of the murder victim's truck. Investigators fanned out to search the various small towns in Mahaska County for more promising witnesses. They found one who said he noticed something at around 10.30 or 11 on the morning of the crime spree. He saw a dark green pickup truck near the town of Oskaloosa. The witness identified the driver as a local man whom he'd never seen in that truck before. He claimed there was a passenger inside, but the truck pulled away before he could see who it was. The individual who reported it recognized the driver of that truck as being Jamie McMahon, a person that he knew and knew well enough to have recognized him and was positive that it was Jamie McMahon. Uh, he also said that there was a second individual in the truck, but he could not get a, a close enough look to tell whether it was even a man or a woman, just that there was a second person in the truck. Hey guys, uh, what I want to do is, uh, Don, I want you to take background on Jamie. At the end of the first day, investigators now had the name and face of a possible suspect in the two killings and bank robbery. 22-year-old local Jamie McMahon. Agents and detectives hoped they could catch up with him and his unidentified accomplice before any more lives were lost. On June 12, 1997, the day after two Iowa residents were killed and the bank was robbed, the FBI and local authorities had the name of a possible suspect, 22-year-old Jamie McMahon. McMahon was last seen driving a green pickup that fit the description of the missing vehicle owned by one of the murdered women. Investigators believe that an unidentified passenger traveling with him may be an accomplice. Special Agent Michael Barrier of the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation learned that Jamie McMahon's last known address was at his parents' home in Oskaloosa, Iowa. His parents were concerned to hear from Agent Barrier because they hadn't seen their son since the crimes had occurred. When we spoke to friends and family about Jamie McMahon, we found that he had been uh, a good kid, hard worker, but that in the past few months prior to these crimes, his personality had changed somewhat, that he began to lose weight, that he had stopped working, uh, and that it just appeared that he was having problems. Do you mind if I Investigators ask you arrived at McMahon's home to search the house and find out more from his parents. This won't take long. He provides over the past several Jamie weeks, McMahon had been spending a lot of time with his 18-year-old stepbrother, Christopher Kaufman. Kaufman lived close by, but the two had different sets of friends and normally didn't see each other much. Lately, they'd been inseparable. Now, both were missing. Because the uh, bank had been robbed by two individuals and because um, uh, the witness had seen McMahon driving a truck with a second individual. We just had to assume that uh, Chris Kaufman was the second person with Jamie McMahon. Detectives interviewed McMahon's friends who remembered seeing him with Christopher Kaufman late on the night before the crimes, driving an old blue station wagon. One friend had lent McMahon the car for the past few months since the suspect couldn't afford one, according to Mahaska County Sheriff's Chief Deputy Paul DeGeest. This vehicle was a blue station wagon, uh, which would appear to be a hatchback type vehicle if you just drove past the back of it. Uh, this would also tie in with the vehicle that the neighbor seen in Barb Garber's driveway earlier that morning. Investigators searched the car, but found no evidence that physically connected McMahon or Kaufman to Barbara Garber's murder. Any um, unusual behavior? McMahon's friends mentioned that he had always wanted a dark green pickup like the victim's, but the sticker price was out of his range. 
Jamie had an infatuation with uh, this particular type of vehicle. Earlier that year, he had one on order that fit uh, the, the same as what Barb Garber's was and did not have the money to pay for it, so he canceled the order. His friends added that the day before the murder, McMahon had stopped by with Kaufman to borrow something else. A 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun that he claimed he was going to use to shoot stray cats. The same type of gun was used in both murders. Card. Investigators asked his friends to call immediately if the suspect contacted them for any reason. Authorities learned from several other friends that the suspected murderer had recently been abusing the drug methamphetamine. FBI Special Agent Scott French was concerned about McMahon's mental state, since the illegal drug is an addictive stimulant. Abusers of methamphetamine suffer a variety of side effects, one of which is they can be awake for several days. Second is they have loss of appetite but of a greater concern to law enforcement is they have significantly clouded judgment. They become increasingly paranoid and they may be easily agitated. A widespread manhunt was launched for the stepbrothers in the dark green pickup truck that was still missing. 5.30, the neighborhood cameras revealed that a small blue car was seen at the Garber residence. Agents and police also notified additional law enforcement agencies and media outlets throughout the Midwest. Warrants for murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution were issued for McMahon and Kaufman. Initially, we felt that uh, they had left the state, and uh, we could only speculate as to where. Um, most of the uh, investigators there felt very strongly that they were probably headed for Mexico. Investigators revisited the homes of the pair's friends and family, figuring they would try to contact them. We're going to put a recording device under the phone. McMahon's ex-girlfriend gave the FBI permission to install a phone tap and recorder. Okay. Figure out where he's at. And if McMahon on. called, okay. agents would be ready to trace his location. As the manhunt for McMahon and Kaufman continued, a call came into the task force office. Two sets of local parents reported that their teenage daughters were missing. The high school girls, 16 and 17, had not been home since the previous evening. They were best friends and were always together. With two killers on the loose, the parents feared for the girls' lives. Investigators discovered that McMahon and Kaufman had been partying with several girls at a motel in Oskaloosa the night before the crime spree. At the motel, a clerk told investigators the girls had stayed overnight and were still in the room on the morning of the crimes. Yeah, those are the girls. Yeah, those are the girls. Yeah, those are the ones. The employee saw McMahon and Kaufman with a green truck later on that same day. She said the two girls left with the stepbrothers. Green. Yeah. Investigators issued another nationwide bulletin that the fugitives McMahon and Kaufman were last seen in Iowa traveling with two teenage girls. We were concerned for the safety of the girls. Um, I believed at the time that if uh, Jamie McMahon was willing to kill someone he knew, uh, that the girls may be in danger. Investigators responded to a promising tip that came into the hotline. McMahon and Kaufman had been spotted at a trailer several miles away from their family home. Investigators had no way of knowing if they were still armed, high on methamphetamine, or if the teenage girls were still with them. Not wanting to take any chances and not knowing uh, their mental state, um, we had the FBI SWAT team come in. Uh, basically, we surrounded the, uh, the cabin and came in from several different directions. Heavily armed agents hoped for the best, but were prepared for the worst. 
Officers yelled for McMahon and Kaufman to come out. There was no reply. The police team stormed in, ready to use deadly force. In June of 1997, the FBI and Iowa investigators stormed a trailer in a remote field on the second day of a nationwide manhunt for 22-year-old Jamie McMahon and his 18-year-old stepbrother, Chris Kaufman. The pair were suspected in two murders and robbing $65,000 from a bank. Two missing teenage girls were believed to be with them. Investigators found no trace of the fugitives or the girls. Sightings of the stepbrothers in the stolen green pickup were reported from as far south as Texas to as far north as Minnesota. With $65,000 in cash and a 12-hour lead, Iowa Special Agent Michael Beria realized the pair could be anywhere by now. We were unable to really come up with um, any place that they may go. We had information that they might have gone to Minnesota. We also had information that they may have friends or relatives in Florida. Um, but we didn't really have any solid direction of travel where they went. After seven days of searching, the FBI got the call they'd been hoping for. Yeah, they're looking all over the place for you. Agents were ready with a phone tap when Jamie McMahon called his ex-girlfriend. During the call, McMahon asked if authorities had any idea who killed Mrs. Garber and Eileen Schultz. He was fishing for information. He was trying to see what we knew and whether we even knew that they were suspects in the case. And she just told him, you know, what did you do and, and uh, why are they looking for you? And he became aware quite quickly that he was a suspect and that we did know that they were involved. Um, and he hung up. The agent called his supervisor at the Mahaska County Command Center. FBI Special Agent Scott French learned McMahon had been on the phone long enough to trace his call. After we received the phone call from McMahon, I began the process of trying to track down the number from where he called. At some point, we reached a snag with a phone company outside the area, wherein they could not determine or provide the number until the following day. Agents learned that the suspected killer had called from a hotel in Kissimmee, Florida. The employee recognized photos of the two fugitives and confirmed the two teenage girls were with them. Are they in this hotel? Are they registered here? Are they in the hotel at this time? Please check. No, they checked out. But they had all just left. When did they leave? The phone company's delay had given McMahon and Kaufman just enough time to stay ahead of law enforcement. McMahon and Kaufman are gone. We missed them. So they know we're looking for them now. They know we're looking for them. Agents were concerned that McMahon and Kaufman would be more difficult to find now since they knew the FBI were on their trail. All right, well, thanks, and I'll uh, get back on this. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Though authorities had missed McMahon and Kaufman in Florida, the two teenage girls who had been traveling with the fugitives returned home safely to their parents. Parents, take a seat, get some coffee. Investigators yeah, questioned back. the girls about the time they spent with McMahon and Kaufman. The teenagers confirmed that they had stayed with the young men at the Oskaloosa Motel on the night prior to the crimes. The next morning, McMahon and Kaufman came by in a green pickup with a lot of cash. McMahon, the eldest of the group at 22, offered them a free trip to Florida. The impressionable teenage girls agreed to go with the stepbrothers and didn't ask a lot of questions. 
the girls told us that they weren't aware that there'd been a homicide and they weren't really aware that there'd been a bank robbery as such, but they were aware that something had happened to allow uh, McMahon and Kaufman to have so much money. The girls told investigators that on their way out of town, they stopped by the Des Moines River. One of the stepbrothers threw a duffel bag into the water, but he never told them what was inside. After that, the four of them drove south toward Florida. For the first week of this uh, trip with uh, McMahon and Kaufman, um, the girls treated it like it was a vacation. Uh, they were having a good time. They were eating out. They were going to uh, uh, amusement parks. One of their first stops was in Branson, Missouri. There, the four entertained themselves on carnival rides. The girls said they took photos along the way. They had with them a couple of uh, Instamatic cameras, and we took those cameras and had the film developed, and we had uh, photographs of McMahon and Kaufman, and one picture in particular is of Chris Kaufman sitting in Barb Garber's pickup truck. After their trip to Disney World, the girls said that McMahon and Kaufman finally confessed to them about the murders and the bank robbery. Kaufman had dyed his hair blonde to disguise himself. High on methamphetamine, the armed men also told the girls they wouldn't mind killing them as well. The girls were frightened and told the fugitives they wanted to return home. All right, look, here. McMahon gave them money for a taxi and train fare back to, to Iowa. Get back home. They told investigators they had no idea where the stepbrothers were headed. Well, they didn't say where they were going. They just gave us money and we left. Investigators concluded the girls were not involved since they remained at the Oskaloosa Motel when the crimes had occurred. They released the teenagers into their parents' custody without filing charges. On the Des Moines River, an off-duty Iowa trooper happened to come across a bag in the water. He opened it to find a pair of black ski masks and brown coveralls. The officer also found a wallet with a driver's license. He contacted police and gave them the evidence. The wallet and driver's license belonged to the murdered Island Schultz. The clothing matched what the robbers were wearing when they made off with $65,000 in cash from an Iowa bank. Jamie McMahon and Christopher Kaufman remained the prime suspects, and they were still out there, armed and strung out. On June 30th, 1997, 19 days after the search for McMahon and Kaufman began, a call came into the Escambia County Sheriff's Department in Florida. A motorist in Pensacola wanted to talk to police. He told them he was driving on a nearby highway when he noticed a green pickup. The night before, he had seen a story about the manhunt for McMahon and Kaufman on television. The truck seemed to fit the description of the fugitive's vehicle. The motorist pulled alongside to get a closer look. He thought the driver looked exactly like the man featured on the show. The truck also had Iowa tags. The motorist pulled off and phoned police. The Escambia County Sheriff's Department realized the motorist's description of the truck matched the one Iowa authorities were looking for. Iowa authorities wanted to be sure this wasn't just another false lead. It seemed promising since the suspected murderers were last seen in Florida. 
They confirmed the license number and sent photos of the stepbrothers to the sheriffs in Pensacola. Iowa investigators alerted them to use caution since the fugitive pair were considered armed and dangerous. An urgent be on the lookout was issued for the green truck in the Pensacola area. Deputies searched local roads, shopping centers, and motel parking lots for any sign of the fugitives or the stolen green pickup truck. In the parking lot of a local motel, two officers spotted a green pickup truck. Motel residents usually park close to their room entrance, but this vehicle was obscured near the back behind a fence. Its Iowa license plate and description checked out. It was the murder victim's stolen truck from Iowa. Authorities had no time to lose if they hoped to bring in the fugitives before they eluded them once again. Pensacola, Florida motel. Authorities had finally located the stolen pickup truck driven by Jamie McMahon and Christopher Kaufman. Stepbrothers suspected of two murders and a bank robbery in Iowa. Escambia County deputies needed to confirm if the armed fugitives were staying there. I know you've seen these gentlemen today, people, man. Yes. The motel clerk recognized the photos of McMahon and Kaufman. But she added that there was a third man in their room. She gave deputies the room number. Police told her the motel had to be evacuated. Yes, no problem. Okay, I'll go with you. Fearing that the stepbrothers had possibly taken a hostage, deputies called in a hostage negotiating team. We know they've killed two already. Escambia County Sheriff Sergeant Jerry Cox was in charge. We want to establish a command post in this area. We knew they were armed, we knew that they were murder suspects, we knew they were bank robbers. Uh, they were seriously uh, violent criminal individuals. So we got the call out, our SWAT team and, and uh, crisis negotiators got the call out, and, uh, and we responded to the motel. The motel was evacuated. The hostage negotiating team set up an emergency center nearby. SWAT teams took up positions near McMahon and Kaufman's room. Snipers set up on a nearby roof. No one knew the situation with the third man or his relationship with the stepbrothers. They had no way of knowing if they were all still inside. The negotiator secured the line and attempted to get them on the phone. Okay, we got the line. Yeah. From the man's tone of voice, the negotiator believed he was likely a hostage. When I made contact with the room, the first individual that I talked to was the hostage himself. He gave me a false name, and I began to try to talk to him a little bit, knowing that was not the correct name, of course, and uh, try to find out what his situation was, what his physical condition was, and what the situation was in the room. The man said he had just met the fugitives hitchhiking and stayed with them to party for a while. The stepbrothers had been awake for almost four days, high on meth, and now they were finally crashing. There's no way. They'll, they'll shoot. The man had since become aware they were murder suspects and that they were still armed. He was absolutely frightened out of his mind. He did not know what to do, and he knew that they were willing to take life. They had made statements to him that they would not be taken alive, and therefore he was afraid to make any moves uh, because of what they might do to him. Bobby. The negotiator tried to convince him to leave the room, but the rescue team would be at the door when he emerged. While the man considered what to do, McMahon woke up. It's the cops, man. You guys, you guys gotta let me out of here. 
One of my major concerns was the fact that they were known drug users and had been partying for a number of days. Uh, when people are on, under the influence of drugs or alcohol, when it comes to negotiations, one of the things you have to be aware of is how those chemicals can alter a person's personality and, and al alter their reactions. Uh, they might be extremely aggressive. Due to their three-week drug binge, it became clear to the negotiator that the fugitives were not thinking clearly, if at all. Calm down, man. Whoa, 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 calm down. Here, here. His first concern was to get the third man out safely without more bloodshed. Authorities were all too aware that the situation could turn violent quickly. Paramount in my mind was, was the fact that if they killed two already, and those, both those murders, based on my information, were cold-blooded calculated murders with no thought given whatsoever to, to the consequences, that they could easily do that again. Hold on. Calm down. Just sit Hold down. Calm down, man. Just Hold on. No, man. Put that away. Put that away, man. Who is this? Chill. Just calm down, man. Just Hold on. Sharpshooters stood at the ready. The negotiator tried to convince them to let the man out of the room before someone else was killed. Shouldn't have done that, man. Man, what do you want? He's not. He's not us. There's no. I'm. I'm out. No way, man. Just gonna walk out? There's no way. All right, fine. You don't mean nothing crap to us. Let the hostage go. Man, Chris, let him go. After two hours, the armed men finally allowed him to leave unharmed. Here, put your hands on top of your head. Come towards me. Come towards me. Come towards me. SWAT members spirited the hostage out of the line of fire to where the negotiators continued to work. The hostage said he met the fugitives in New Orleans and had been with them for several days. He said they had a lot of drugs and a lot of cash in the room. They only had one handgun as far as he knew. With two armed fugitives still barricaded in the motel room, a peaceful resolution did not seem likely. In June of 1997, Hostage negotiators and a SWAT team surrounded a Pensacola, Florida motel where two armed fugitives, wanted for two murders and a bank heist in Iowa, remained barricaded inside their room, strung out on drugs. Escambia County Sheriff Sergeant Jerry Cox was the lead negotiator. It's the most difficult segment of the negotiations for me was to try to overcome the emotional state that they were in as a result of their drug use, their prolonged um, uh, activity of being awake for so long, uh, and to try to, to direct them in a peaceful resolution. He spoke Chris to 18-year-old Christopher man. Kaufman for some time. This is Chris. We didn't kill everybody. The young fugitive was aware that he was surrounded by police. Sergeant Cox tried to convince him to do the sensible thing and come out unarmed. But one of the things I was able to learn from Kaufman was that he was tired, that he was just too, too physically and mentally exhausted to be making an awful lot of decisions. Worn out, Kaufman passed the phone to his 22-year-old stepbrother, Jamie McMahon. The negotiator noticed that McMahon seemed more lucid, more mature than his younger brother. He used it as a hook to separate the two. I told him, I said, it's obvious to me that you're the one who's running the show in there. I need you to take charge and do something for me. And he said, what is that? And I said, well, what I need you to do is I need you to take care of your brother. I need you to get him out of there. Look, just go. The strategy worked. Just, just go. I started this. Let me finish. Red man, red one, white man. Chris, man, I just want you to go. McMahon no. didn't want his brother to suffer no, no, whatever consequences me, McMahon go. was going to face by staying in the room. Let's go. SWAT members secured Christopher Kaufman. Now, only his stepbrother remained. McMahon teetered between indecision and despair. He knew his options were limited. 
The 22-year-old began to weigh life in prison versus suicide. I heard what was sounded to me like a weapon being charged. It was an automatic pistol that he had in there, so it sounded like somebody had slid the slide back and, uh, and uh, ejected a shell into the chamber, arming the weapon for firing. Gave me con some concern. I passed that information on to our commanders and our SWAT team. McMahon's judgment was clouded. You there? He didn't want to spend the rest of his life behind bars. No, man. Confused and desperate, he looked to the negotiator for guidance. Okay. And the thing that seemed to work the most was constantly reminding him that as long as he was alive, he had, a, he had some hope, he had a chance. Once he was dead, there was no chance. And that in Iowa, there was no death penalty. He had an awful lot of years ahead of him to figure this out. McMahon relented to the negotiator's insight. Four hours after it had begun, the last fugitive walked out of the room, unarmed as instructed. The negotiator was able to defuse the situation without death or injury. Agents secured and searched the motel room. They recovered $29,000 in cash of the $65,000 that was stolen. They also found the 22 semi-automatic handgun. On every table rested empty beer bottles, marijuana, and powdered methamphetamine. Ballistics tests later confirmed the 22 was the weapon used to kill the two women in Iowa. Authorities questioned the pair separately. I understand from your brother that you committed both of the murders. No, one of the... Kaufman told investigators it was his stepbrother's idea to rob the bank. To pull off the heist, they needed a car. McMahon already had his eye on the first victim's pickup truck, the truck he initially wanted to use as the getaway vehicle. I think I may have left at a different friend's house. You mind if I use your phone real quick? Mrs. Garber knew McMahon and allowed the brothers into her house. Man, just put the phone right back down, please. Yeah. Just sit down! Once inside, just Kaufman claimed his stepbrother egged him on to kill her. Just do it! I right, do it! He wanted Mrs. Garber dead so she wouldn't report the vehicle missing. Kaufman said he shot Barbara Garber twice, then again to make sure she was dead. Since McMahon loved her truck so much, he wanted to keep it and steal a different vehicle to use in the robbery. McMahon decided to try another friend of his, Island Schultz. Like Mrs. Garber, their second victim let McMahon in along with Kaufman. The pair claimed they needed money for gas. She lent them five dollars. As she bent over to put a music tape on, Kaufman told investigators his stepbrother shot her in the back of the head. To make sure she was dead, McMahon shot her again between the eyes. The stepbrothers took Schultz's car keys and wallet. Over the next three weeks, the pair spent $36,000 on hotels, prostitutes, and drugs before they were apprehended in Pensacola, Florida. Though Iowa had no death penalty, Jamie McMahon, 22, and Christopher Kaufman, 18, faced the federal death penalty for two carjackings resulting in death. They faced another federal charge for bank robbery. To avoid a death sentence, the stepbrothers pled guilty to all federal and state charges. Their convictions left many unanswered questions for the people of Iowa and Mahaska County Chief Deputy Paul DeGeest. These two guys were as common as any two boys next door. I can't explain why they would, would go to this uh, extent to, to get a vehicle and, and to go on vacation or just to impress a couple of girls. It's just, it's just crazy. You'd never guess that, that they would be the two type of individuals to do that, knowing their parents, knowing uh, their backgrounds. I mean, it's just, 
just didn't make sense. Jamie McMahon serves the rest of his life in Leavenworth, Kansas. Christopher Kaufman serves his time in solitary confinement in the tough Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado.